there again, everybody, uh, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our, our virtual roundtable where we discuss all things Beatles. And I'm uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three co-hosts. Ken Michaels, the uh, the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hi, Al. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ken. And uh, and our musical, our uh, our resident musicologist, uh, longtime classical music reviewer, and head of the New York Times Beatle desk for uh, for a long time, and now doing uh, various freelance classical music reviews and other things. And that's Alan Cozen. Hello, Al. Hello, everyone. And last but not least, the uh, the the world's uh, the world's uh, last remaining full-time Beatles uh, journalist, uh, and that's uh, Steve Marinucci of uh, Billboard and AXS.com. Hey, Steve. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. Now this is actually part two. Of uh, of a show that uh, that we uh, that we began last week, a look at this massive box set of uh, of Flowers in the Dirt, the the latest installment in the Paul McCartney uh, archive collection. And uh, we actually left off. We we got through uh, with a great deal of discussion. <laughs> the uh, the what you might call the paper goods. Uh, you know, in the box itself, and then also the main album. So we have actually still quite a bit to go because, as I said, this is this this set is absolutely jam packed. You know, anybody that, com- as Alan has mentioned, anybody that complains about uh, well, it costs so much and all this sort of thing, well, you know, it does. You know, yes, it does cost, but you're getting you're getting a massive amount of material. So I think first what we'll do is we'll take a look at the um, I guess the second and third discs because since the, the since the songs are the same on both discs and they are the basically the the demos uh, the Elvis and Paul demos and the band demos for the Elvis and uh, and Paul collaborations. And which are very, very interesting, including a couple of songs that uh, uh, that I don't believe uh, at least one song that I know I've never heard before. And um, Ken, why don't uh, why don't I uh, have you chime in on this first? Well, I got to tell you, when I first got the box set, all I would do was listen to these demos <laughs> as much as I wanted to get to the rest of it because it just sounded so good. I love the acoustic demos of Paul and Elvis because in terms of their harmonies, they just sound perfect together. They really do. And um, it makes you realize, especially, and you can apply this to all demos, when you strip everything down to the bare bones where it's just a song and, and an acoustic guitar or a piano and it's no frills, no production, and the songs are good, that's proof right there to me how strong the songs are. And Paul and Elvis worked really well together. And um, in particular, the, what was a real treat, and actually, you know, these songs, these demos have been bootlegged before, as we've discussed. But 20 Fine Fingers, which mm-hmm. is uh, a song that had never been released before, sounds fantastic. And to me, when I heard that song, I immediately thought this is Buddy Holly-esque. Very much um, so. mm-hmm. And I said to myself, why on earth didn't they release this? You know, and um, there's another song called Tommy's Coming Home, Mm -hmm. which neither one of them released before. And it's another strong song. And I love the fact that you have the acoustic demos and then the studio demos with the band. And in most cases, Elvis Costello was with the band. But the mere fact that they went into the studio and did these same nine songs, and even those two songs that I just mentioned that haven't been released meant that they were really strongly considered. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's a real treat, you know, the to hear... I know Elvis Costello said that The Lovers That Never Were, which is a song that I really love, he felt that what they did together in their acoustic demo couldn't top, you know, even the studio version that Paul released on Off the Ground. And, I, and in its own way, you know, the powerful vocals that Paul had on that, on that demo are just remarkable. You know, they were they were a great team. 
And I love the contrast of going from that to the studio demos where they're not fully produced, they're not polished. They're going through the ropes there and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. So it's their songs in transition, but they're still very good the way they are. And uh, a big highlight for me, one of the songs that, that Paul and Elvis wrote, which only Elvis released, was So Like Candy. Mm-hmm. And to hear Paul do the lead vocal without Elvis in parts of the song is a real treat because I've only heard, you know, Elvis's version all these sure. years. So when, when you take a look at both the demos, the, the acoustic in the studio, I just, I, I love the fact that you've got two for each song like that. And it's, it's such a treat to listen to those. They're all powerful in their own way. And I do love the contrast. And uh, if you just want to hear Paul and Elvis sing, there's nothing better than those nine acoustic demos right there. Mm-hmm. You know? So yeah. I was very, very happy with that. I think they work, you know, the, both, both discs work very, very well. And it's, uh, you know, listening to them, it's, 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 uh, it's very tantalizing because they really give a glimpse of what, say, a McCartney-Costello album might have been like. And, you know, uh, in fact, if you've read some of the interviews that uh, uh, that have been been out there, uh, there was uh, there was some talk of possibly a situation with with possibly Elvis producing the album for Paul. And uh, that probably (laughs) that probably would not have worked out very well. In fact, I, I something something tells me that uh, that uh, uh, it might have ended up uh, not unlike the situation with Nigel Godrich uh, after Chaos and Creation, where uh, they <laughs> they basically parted under not under the greatest uh, uh, the greatest terms. But it's you know as I said, it's a it's a a very tantalizing glimpse at what uh, you know what might have been uh alan what do you have to say about that well a lot in a way uh, yes, uh like 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 ken um you know the first things i did the thing i did when i got this was go directly to the elvis and paul demos and um those two discs and i would say i've probably listened to those most um just because i mean the the acoustic demos have been all or mostly out on bootleg over the years, and the bootleg copies have been actually pretty good quality. Um, so they were a little familiar. So I was especially interested in the more produced demos. I'm not absolutely persuaded that those are demos. I kind of think – I mean I could be wrong, but I kind of think that that was the start of what could have been the finished production. Um, would have needed more overdubs, would have needed I, – I- I agree with you, Alan. Yeah. I definitely with you um, there. But I don't hear that. Well, um, and also, by the way, I mean, uh, uh, people don't mention this very much, but there is a hidden bonus track at the end of the acoustic mm-hmm. demos one. Yeah. Which, which is uh, a, yet another version of The Lovers That Never Were. So you got three right. versions um, that's a Jeff Emmerich mix. But when you go on to the studio version of that one, I mean, the studio demo version of that one to me is the single most tantalizing thing on this set because what I think we're hearing is Paul experimenting with the vocal on that. I think that he's singing it um, thinking specifically that what he's doing is not going to be released, but he wants to hear what it sounds like when he sings in different ways, and he's really out there taking risks. And it's just incredible singing, emotional, I mean, everything about it. I mean, there are, there are things that are a little bit imperfect here and there, but I think you're just seeing him really reaching for an incredible vocal performance, which it, you know, so mostly is that you know i for me it really entirely is um i just i just find that one track just so incredible um mm. you look at these 
this list of songs to which you would add the three on the cassette demo. Uh, I don't want to mm-hmm. confess Shallow Grave, Mistress and Maid. And then for my personal playlist, I've pulled over the demos of Veronica and Pad Paws and Claws from Elvis's um, Spike reissue. Mm-hmm. Um, just to have the largest collection of these things. And <laughs> I think we're we're looking here at what could have been Paul and Elvis's best album of the period. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I love Spike, I love Flowers in the Dirt, but this album really could have been it. And, and it's, to me, just a shame that the plug was pulled on it. And... Uh, you know, I, I just kind of wish they finished it. Someone said to that said that to Elvis Costello in an interview or something like it. You know, why didn't you finish it? And and he sort of diplomatically said, um, "Well, you can consider this the album. You know, the the demos that Paul just released, um, and that might have been in the Jeff Slade interview. I'm not sure." Um, mm-hmm. I think so. I think so. Yeah. In fact, there was that uh, mentioned the one little bit about uh, them throwing around ideas, and Paul mentioned, uh, <laughs> "Why don't we do something that sounds like the Human League?" And yeah, Paul yeah. Had, to, had to excuse himself from the room mm. because <laughs> yeah, he was, was so upset. That was for that day is done. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Elvis wanted to have a, a mournful brass backing mm-hmm. and Paul was thinking more of a synthetic 80s human league sound yeah mm-hmm. and uh Elvis wasn't too pleased with that idea yeah and seeing mm-hmm. as that so, for Elvis this was a song about his own grandmother's funeral you kind of think okay you know maybe he should have won that fight but yeah so I don't know I I just think this I think this is the beginning of an incredible album in it, and it's incredible as it is, but I, I really just wish they had finished it. Um, like mm-hmm. this one, like you look at this track list, you wouldn't see me saying about any of these things, oh, it's like, you know, Oue Le Soleil, like why do you need that? You know, every single mm-hmm. one of these songs is right. great, you know. So that's what I think. <laughs> well, if you, if you read the, the Flowers in the Dirt book, mm. I know that there's a point in there where Paul talks about why wasn't it all a Paul and Elvis album. And he said that I don't think he ever thought of it as being that from the very beginning. He wanted to mix that with some of his own songs. Mm -hmm. Um, Elvis gives the impression in Unfinished Music, his autobiography. Was it Unfinished Music? Was that what it was called? Mm -hmm. Uh, His autobiography that they were thinking about in, in terms of possibly doing an album together and then they stopped and it went in a different direction and they both were able to use some of the songs. And I think we've probably all heard as well that it, it, it's, you know, they, they didn't totally see eye to eye, you know, I yeah, mean, exactly. Elvis, Elvis was there to serve a particular function, which was to be able to come in as kind of an equal i mean he was really big at the time and be able to say Mm -hmm. listen you know as one of the great songwriters of this period i can tell you that doesn't work and i don't think paul sort of took very well to that so you know and that's that's a pity but it's just the way it is you know artists are artists and they and they (laughs) You know, as uh, you know, people have said, there's only one man who could have told him that, and he would for him to listen, and he wasn't, uh, shall we say, available at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul also trusts George Martin. Well, yeah. You know, it it wasn't just John. You know, so. I have a feeling, though, in terms, especially in terms of songwriting. Uh, I think really, uh, really, John was the, really the one peer mm. that, he, that he really respected and that, you know, could actually kind of stand up to him as a, you know, as a songwriting peer. Right. That, you know, that even, you know, that that in George Martin's case, I think it was probably more in terms of what, you know, the recordings would sound like. Mm hmm. But as far as songwriting, I think it was you know the only one that uh, that could really say no, this isn't this isn't good. Would be well, certainly, been. yeah, certainly in Paul's eyes, because mm-hmm, yeah. uh, if you've read some recent, and actually he was saying this in the book off the record, 
which I believe the interview then was around the time of Flowers in the Dirt. But he was saying, let's face it, Denny Lane is not John Lennon. Yeah. You know, okay. Stevie Wonder is not John Lennon. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if he mentioned Eric Stewart or Michael Jackson or whatever, but in Paul's own eyes, John was the tops. Yeah. You know, it's and it's, it wasn't just it wasn't just the fact that he admired him, but they shared so much history together that you can't compete with that in Paul's mind. And in a way, it's a shame because all these other people, Stevie Wonder, come on, <laughs> is one of the greatest talents we've ever had. So when you say that Stevie's no John Lennon, I understand where Paul's coming from because they also had all that history together right. from mm-hmm. a personal point of view. But um, it's a shame if, if he has to measure everyone that he ever works with to John. And as far as people who were, you know, living in 1989, Elvis was really actually as close to John Lennon as you're going to find. I mean, he was in, it yeah. is an incredible lyricist, an incredible mm-hmm. melodist. Uh, you know, he's just a great composer all around. And I think that the two of them brought something to each other that really was just incredible that you hear in these demos and, and mm-hmm. studio demos. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's more of a, a, a fear of having Elvis compared with, with Lennon. I think that was, I don't think Paul just want, Paul just didn't want to go there. And I think that's, I think that's the whole thing it kind of, can kind of going on what you said, but I think, I think maybe there's a little more to it than that. Um, well, like, just, ex- except that, you know, that Paul's addressed that himself and talking about how they would, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, they would sit together with uh, two, uh, with the two guitars while mm-hmm. they were writing. And mm-hmm. it was very similar to the, you know, just the, even the stance that he and John would take when they were, you know, on, you know, separate beds in, uh, right. you know, in, in, you know, in John's bedroom, that's that sort of thing. So but that, that may have mm-hmm. been the reason why the project, the project didn't go as far as probably everybody wishes it, it would have mm-hmm. uh, to avoid that full blown John Lennon type. You know, why, for example, when Alan was talking about doing the full album, that's probably that may be the reason why they never went that far. Because they were they were afraid of the comparison. Possibly. Yeah, they were possibly afraid of going to that level and it had, you know, and had that album turned out that good. And you, you really, we kind of know it would have um, it would have brought it up to it to a higher level and and started all those comparisons uh full blown you know um well, i don't know that just a theory there is the possibility and jeff slate uh has uh, uh addressed this of mm-hmm. um of the possibility because after all at that point elvis had a you know had a had a great record and a great track record as a producer mm-hmm so, you know, there might have been a situation where if it would have been a Paul McCartney album, but with Elvis Costello producing it. And, you know, which would have, which would have been fine, but uh but again, you know, the, the you know, Paul has very <laughs> very specific ideas on how he wants to on how a record should be made or how a song should be written and he doesn't really like to be you know, contradicted or told, no, this isn't uh, this isn't good by any again by anybody other than John Lennon. Right. Well, he also yeah. would have had to share credit, uh, full credit with Costello, and that mm-hmm. might have also been an issue. You know, I mean, maybe he didn't want to do that. It's possible. You know? So I mean, there. I mean, we can sit here and speculate all day long. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. But the weird but, thing but, is that you know you look at this collaboration and it seems very obvious that Elvis Costello was being brought in at that stage in Elvis's career as mm-hmm. someone who could you know more than than Michael Jackson who was a guest mm-hmm. shot or Stevie Wonder who was a guest shot or Eric Stewart who you know was barely visible in the stuff that he collaborated on right. you're bringing mm-hmm. someone oh. in kind of to be not maybe maybe not an equal but but kind of an equal you know someone yeah someone mm-hmm. really big at the time renowned for right. the same stuff John was renowned for and, you know, so why would you do the experiment and then 
scuttle the experiment because it was working in the way the experiment was meant to work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. See what I mean? Mm. No, you're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. Do but, you think it, it benefited Paul more than Elvis that they worked together? Or what did Paul bring to Elvis's songs? More accessibility? His name. Well, there's that too. I mean, I think it, it in, in the in the long run, it probably benefited Elvis. I don't know. Just, I mean, he he was uh, you know as you know as much of an icon as Paul is. Elvis was especially in the eighties. Uh, Elvis was a pretty big deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so I don't know if he really needed somebody to uh, you know to give him musical credibility, say. Uh, you know, whereas I think Paul was uh, a little bit, you know, drifting a little bit uh, because of the fact that Press to Play had gotten a critical, you know, drubbing in, in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. So he uh, and and, you know, he had uh, he had worked with Phil Ramone and that didn't work out. And um it uh, so he was he was kind of uh, kind of drifting, and so I think I think that you know that partnership could have uh, could have worked extremely well if it had gone if it had gone all the way, say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know I, I think tremendously of Elvis Costello as a talent and as a songwriter, and certainly he sold a decent number of records through the years, but he never mm-hmm. achieved the mega star status of Paul. Oh, of course. So, you know, so my question is, who did it really benefit more? He was a big star. You can't, I mean, he's not, he's not a Beatle, but he was on Saturday Night Live many times. So he was, I'm not denying that, you know, but he was never commercially a huge giant star. He's had his following and it's a strong following and he could sell out, you know, the venues where he plays, but he's never achieved, you know, that kind of status. He he might he might say that himself, you know. I mean, I mean, he. El, one other thing we know about Elvis is that he was a huge Beatles fan, and he, and and, yes. and, mm-hmm. and not just a Lennon fan either. I mean, he was a huge McCartney fan too. So mm-hmm. I mean, yep. for him, this was a a dazzling opportunity. And other th- right. otherwise, you know, it's hard to know what what Paul brought to it because they're both great melodists. I mean, you have to assume mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. have to assume that they were pushing each other. To come up right. with you know great melodies and and uh, and you know possibly Elvis had an edge on the lyrics. Um, I would kind of think so, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, but we don't know, you know. We don't know. It's it's I. I it would be great to sort of um, you know have complete video record of the entire collaboration so we could see who brought what to that would to, be either, yeah. either, either that, that or get nice. get one of them on the show that yeah. would be even yeah. better. <laughs> can, I, can i say something about the demos um, i was i was just well yeah i was just going to ask if you, you you didn't you didn't really say anything specifically about the uh the demos themselves so yes well please. i i agree that the the demos were the first thing i went to when when i got mm-hmm. uh, when I got my copy of this thing, but I will say kind of, um, in contrast to a little of what Alan said, the original demos had a little more interest for me than the, than the band demos only because the uh, original demos were a little raw. And I, and we also should mention, by the way, the two exclusive demos that are on McCartney.com of this one yeah. extraction mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that you can download, even if you don't buy the box that are really good um uh, this one uh I, I don't know if you'd call this one i think they're probably both uh 88 from 88 but uh, this one is fantastic uh, uh yeah. distractions is is i don't think is good but i but this one is just a, a great sounding version but i thought the original demos were just tremendous and the one that really knocked me over was that day is done Mm-hmm. I was sitting there listening to it yesterday, and my mouth was just dropping. The, mm-hmm. the way they were both harmonizing on that thing is just fantastic. So those are they're, – they're both – the demos, in, you know, are great. But I think if you really want to, you know, really want to uh, look at the making of the album, it's those original demos that are just tremendous. And those are obviously the big deal. You know, and you can get those. You can get in the special edition as well as the deluxe set. 
but yeah, those are those are just fantastic. They, they really have a are. they have a basement tapes kind of quality, you know. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Except they're I mean they're great. They're excellent quality. I mean yeah. it's not like but yeah, they do. They definitely do that, you know, listening to all of those uh and also you know, at the same time watching some of the video stuff too which we'll we're going to talk about, but yeah, I mean listening to them work those songs out uh especially my bright face when you hear the early versions of that contrasted with the later versions it's it's mm-hmm. it's, ama- it's really amazing mm-hmm. yeah yeah by the yeah. way alan you were talking about the studio demos and that you thought that they were fairly close to what maybe paul envisioned for the finished product well possibly i mean what i'm saying is that i think these are the beginnings of what would have been the finished studio recordings which right. would have been more produced obviously different vocals mm-hmm. different you know added things but that's just yeah. the way i hear them like you know but i i hear when i listen to you one or two mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. very close that's very yeah. close to yeah. what Extremely ended up close. on the album mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. i was surprised when i heard that so it was mm-hmm. it was developed fairly quickly i think yeah, mm-hmm. I love that you know, the exchange, the sort of give and take between them on "You Want Her Too." You know, I mean that's that's a really good example of you know how their working relationship seems to have 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 worked. You know, just mm-hmm. like back right. and forth on the lead vocal. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, as you say that uh, the second disc. Uh, had, really does have a, a you know a no pun intended band feel to it you know mm-hmm. not the band but it has that kind of basement tapes feel to it yeah mm-hmm. now we should point Definitely. out in deference to mm-hmm. the people who've been complaining that the download disc um, you know should have been a CD that together discs two and three take only seventy one minutes and really would yeah. fit on a single CD. Just saying, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and that uh, and that enables us to segue into that most controversial <laughs> part of uh, of this whole package, and that is the the download package that you can only you can only obtain in the package. There is a card with a uh, with a code. You can go to paulmccartney.com and uh, and there's this little tiny window. <laughs> where you where you download all of the all of the tracks from the album and uh Alan you mentioned that there you know you, that along with these demos and things and 12 inch mixes and such that there's also the high quality high res versions of all the songs from the the actual album Right, and the, of the whole production, really, uh, and including the cassette demos that were coming yes. out on Record Store Day, mm-hmm. and uh, but so it means that you get high quality versions of four more mixes of Uwe Le Sole and two mixes of oh, Hardy boy. Party. Um, let's see what they come to together in terms of time. Um, 32 minutes and 49 seconds of Uwe Le Sole and Party Party. Ken? Mm-hmm. Ken? <laughs> yeah? Ken should be very happy. I think well, you, a, you have to answer for this. <laughs> you just encouraged him. <laughs> As a matter of fact, our friend, our friend, Mr. Frangione has mm. uh, has already come up with a uh, uh, with a package that mm. eliminates all of the mixes of Ule de Soleil and uh, and the club mix of Party Party and puts in some more deserving material. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, might I add right here that I happen to agree. You know, I happen to love Ue Le Soleil, but you don't need four different mixes of it. And when you five think about, if you include the one on the album. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> that's the essential one. Hmm. So, um, yeah, and when you think about, as we've discussed before, some of the other material that came out at that time as bonus material that's not on here. Mm-hmm. You know, there's another version of Rough Ride. There's a yeah, studio right. version of The Long and Winding Road. There's, um, I think, P.S. Love Me Do was around that time you Mm -hmm. know you do have that material as well Mm -hmm. so um all the other stuff i mean i I gotta say like you were saying alan flying to my home is such a killer song yes you know i mean it's one of his best b-sides it really has more of a 70s retro sound to me from paul 
Um, and I'm really happy that Back on My Feet is on here. I mean, it was the first McCartney Costello uh, collaboration that was ever released before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that was the B side of Once Upon a Long Ago, although that song is not on here. Um, mm. And uh, the first Stone is one that I happen to like. It's a bit of a different song that that uh, Paul and Hamish Stewart wrote together. Mm-hmm. Has, the loveliest uh, thing. The loveliest thing is a is a great song to me. Mm-hmm. That's yep. a great ballad from uh, those Phil Ramone sessions. That's another thing, kind of like the Paul and Elvis demos. You could easily have, you know, if, if Paul wanted to, which I'm sure he won't, just put together all the the songs he did with Phil Ramone in between. Press to play and flowers in the dirt, and that would make an interesting album. But mm-hmm. I'm sure that's going to be spread out over the different remasters. But um, yeah, and actually, I'm not that big on different mixes, but I do like the Club Lovejoy's mix of this one. I thought that was pretty interesting because it it kind of revolved around the guitar lick that you hear at the end of the song. It actually starts that way in that mix, and I like that approach that was used in it. But I don't necessarily, I don't need to have four different mixes on here of Uwele Soleil, and I don't need to have two different mixes of Party Party, for mm-hmm. that matter. One of each is fine. And then you can <laughs> substitute for me. And, and I must also say, and I, I'm sure that since you're not fond of disco or dance music, for the most <clears> part, <throat> I happen to love Good Sign. Good Sign was a great song that was only available on 12-inch for uh, this one, one of the, the 12 inches for this one. And I thought that was a great dance track. So, you know, it, it's great that he collected many of these songs, although it's not complete. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would much rather, I mean, it, it's, I really hate complaining about anything with this box set because it's, it is either the best one or one of the top three of the remastered box sets that, that he's put out. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't mind different takes, alternate takes of the other songs from Flowers in the Dirt that wasn't the Elvis Costello material. So that would be represented. Like you were just talking about the two demos that are on his website mm-hmm. for this one and for Distractions. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't mind if the, it was that plus all this bonus material. But no, I, I don't need four mixes of Uele So Late together. And even if I love the song, as I do, it cr- requires a lot of patience to sit through four different mixes all at once of that song. So, uh, you know, I'm partly agreeing with you guys. Mm-hmm. And I think you, you mentioned last week well, in part one uh, that uh, you mentioned the Bob Clearmountain uh, mix of uh, a figure of eight. Right. right. And I'm very glad that, that, uh, that Paul included that on here. Mm-hmm. And what did you think of the three cassette demos? I happen to love Shallow Grave a lot. It's a very bluesy song. and It actually sounds complete even though it's a very short song. But kind of like when we were discussing with Tom about I Don't Want to Confess, it doesn't sound like it's finished. Mm-hmm. But it's just interesting to listen to the song as it was and uh, think about what could have been with that song. It, it wasn't fully developed, that one. And Mistress and Maid I liked a lot, although it's very distorted. But, you know, it sounds like the two of them together going directly to a cassette. He left off P.S. Love Me Do. From this period. Thank goodness. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I remember, that, I remember, hear, I remember hearing well, that live. Ugh. Well, you know, okay. That's... So here's the other thing. You know, on, <laughs> even the tracks that you don't like, if you are a collector of the stuff, you well, kind yeah, of that's have true. to yeah, have them. Everything. So yeah, uh, while you true. wished that on one hand he <laughs> hadn't done it, but now that he's done it, you have to somehow keep getting it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> But there is, you know, well, I, I mean, don't I for, don't buy his music as a collector. I buy it for the music first. Hmm. Right. I I don't mind PS Love Me Do all that much. Mm-hmm. It so was we okay. Probably, we probably <laughs> should say that for for people who are collectors and are missing some of this stuff or who are so opposed to having to download it even in, you know, yeah. 4896 that there is out there, you know, in used record collection bins or something uh, you know mm-hmm. that japanese set that came out not long yeah. after the original that has a lot of this stuff on the second disc mm-hmm. including mm-hmm. ps love me do so yep. you can always get that if you have to have these things on a silver disc and with some stuff that is left off this one anyway so 
I'm wondering right. if a lot that was left off here might be put on press to play, you know, because it's you know a few years apart. Yeah. I'm wondering. Uh, if yes, if they indeed do. they do an archive of press to play in, installment of press to play because I have a feeling they're going to do the four the four seventies wings albums that they haven't done yet before right. they do before they do press to play or you know or anything beyond uh, uh, beyond flowers in the dirt. What about off uh, the ground? Uh, yeah, well, that's what I mean. See, you know, off anything. the ground to me is just like the way you hear tug of war and pipes of peace. I hear oh, flowers yeah, and dirt and off the ground. The, the, it's the sequel. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it's mm. yeah, yeah, definitely. But but uh, off the I, ground, off mm-hmm. the ground differs in the fact that the bonus material was so great <laughs> mm. on off the ground. You know, oh, there's yeah. so many killer songs there, and you know, kind of like in the old days when. You look forward to a non-LP B-side on a single. Those were special times when Flowers in the Dark came out and off the ground when you had these import mm-hmm. CD singles and yeah. you would get the single and three other songs right. weren't on the album. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know? And then you have to get another one. And, you know, yeah. and you know, I didn't mind shelling out 15 bucks as for import CDs at the time because – this is special. These are songs that were not on the album. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's it's kind of similar to what people were going through with B-sides. And uh, it wasn't just as a collector that I got them. I wanted those songs. And some of those songs are killer songs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, I'll tell you, uh, Steve, let me get your your thoughts on the downloads, and then we'll go on to the DVD. Well, the downloads, I, I don't really have too much to say about the downloads because, I mean, they're – uh, they are I, I, they are really kind of they're nice archival things they're kind of rough but um, I mean uh, I really paid more attention to the original downloads than I did I mean the original demos than I did to those they're okay the the cassette demos are all right but I I think in the scheme of things what you really want to listen to here is the original demos not and uh, not so much those. Mm-hmm. But that's that's my that's my feeling. I mean, any any of this archival stuff is great, but in the again in the scheme of the album, I think the original demos and the and the the band demos are really what's what's more important here. So well, the the demos are more important because they hadn't been released before. You know, all the stuff that were that were available that are being made available as downloads have right, been but, sides and 12 inches so people have heard them already but it's nice to have them in one collection right but, it's I'm, not but, complete. I'm, yeah. but i'm saying that even that as far as the material on the box set if you want to the, the significant the significance of the of the cassette demos i don't really think they're that significant i think the original demos and the 88 demos are are much more significant so understandable definitely Okay, well then we'll we'll move on then to the uh, the last piece of uh, of this package, and that is the uh, the fourth disc, which is the uh, the DVD, uh, which uh, now you know about half of it is the uh, is the individual videos for uh, for the songs from. Uh, several of the songs uh, from the album, but the the core of the disc. Is the, uh, the 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 sections one called Paul and Elvis and one called Back in the Studio, uh, which uh, which have a treasure trove of uh, of video footage. Uh, you know, you can tell it's early video footage uh, from uh, from 1989, 88 and 89 of the uh, of the sessions uh, uh, in the studio. In fact, a, a little bit. A little bit of that footage did appear in the Put It There uh, documentary, which mm-hmm. of course I hadn't watched in in mm. a very long time. But that um, uh, you know, the, some of it is in there, but obviously a lot more is uh, is in these two uh, these two sections, which are you know really the core of uh, of, of the videos. Um, and it's and it's nice to see the uh, the uh, the Put It There documentary, which was only released on on VHS. In uh, in 1989, you know, especially mm-hmm. for the for those of us who haven't watched it since mm. 1989, mm-hmm. but it's um, it, it's uh, it's certainly interesting. Uh, Steve, what did you think? 
there were some good feelings and some not so good feelings about the videos. I think the the mugging at the beginning of the Paul and Elvis footage, uh, the the section that said Elvis and Paul, the mm-hmm. Paul's tendency to mug for the camera was really distracting. I would have mm. loved if they were just ser- if it was just serious footage and just seeing the two of them working. You know, you don't have to see Paul mugging the camera, uh, especially uh, there, there's the one song and I can't remember which one. I think it's My Brave Face actually where Paul turns and shakes his butt. Oh so yeah. Can't, can't, can't. Oh. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I know Paul likes to fool around him, but I mean, really that it would have been nicer I think in that footage to just be serious. I think that would have been more enjoyable. There were a couple of things that you couldn't help but notice the Susie and the Red Stripes sign <laughs> on the yeah. wall. Yeah. That was kind of, that was kind of interesting. I th- I thought the harmonies on Tommy's Coming Home were fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um uh, and the thing that got me at the very end of that Elvis and Paul thing was it said edited as if to say there's a lot there's there's a lot more and we're not showing it to you. Mm, and that sure. kind of, you know, you kind of went, "Oh, damn, I wish it had been about twice as long because yeah. that that was really fantastic. I had I I really enjoyed you know the serious part of that. I really thought that was that was really good. Mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And any other aspects of the of the disc? Well, of the, of the set as a whole, since we're talking about the the I don't are we talking about the set as a whole or no the the, the the DVD the DVD? No, I mean it was it was I agree with you. It was good to see put it there again. And just curiously, I, I happened to see a inexpensive copy of a Region 2 version hmm. on Amazon yesterday that I went and ordered. I don't, I don't have it. It has a different cover. I'm curious if, it's, if there's any differences. I'm going to find out because I have a, a multi-region player. But, yeah, I mean, seeing that, seeing that again and seeing Paul looking – looking so much younger and seeing the band, uh, you know, the completely different band and kind of mentally going, well, that's the band he had then. This is the band he has now. And there, you know, there's a little bit of difference there. Obviously the, you know, when you look at the, the band playing in the studio and you think about, you know, the guys now, the band now is, is, is better, I think. So, um, Uh, (laughs) that's very debatable. Yeah, really? yeah, really? that's really debatable. Well, uh, I, I, no. I, I think the band now is better. Save this for another show. Yeah, we'll <laughs> save. <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go, go, go ten minutes and say that. I just, mm. I just like, I just like the sound of the, of the band now. But anyway, but it, it, as far as the DVD goes, um, there's a lot of good stuff there. I'm, gl- I'm glad he pulled, put it there out of, out of the vault. I wish he had done that with more of the others. He hasn't done that before, uh, or with all the with all of the, um, the issues. And, but well, had you, had you watched uh, most of the uh, the single the single videos? How long had it been since you had seen those? Yeah, no, there it, it had been a long time since I'd seen those, uh, and it was nice to it was nice to watch those too. Uh, I mean, overall, the DVD just had a lot of great stuff, and it's very well done. Mm-hmm. Weren't some of these videos on McCartney years or not? I yes. They, yeah, I thought it's so. Yeah, I'm sure by, they, the way, I'm sure they were. by the way, it's funny you should mention the McCartney years because I saw a post um, from our friend, uh, our friend Ghosty from W uh, from WFDU, uh, on which uh, Ken, I guess, by the time this this airs will have already made uh, an appearance mm. <laughs> uh, if it all came off as, as scheduled, but he made He made a post uh, over the weekend. He mentioned the fact that he had gone back to his copy of the McCartney years, mm-hmm. which I, and uh, my mind was blown with the fact that it came out 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I thought it came out like, you know, the day before yesterday. And the problem is that apparently the discs his disc won't play anymore. Really? Yeah, I, I saw that. I saw that too, and I, I meant to pull mine out and look at it. And I haven't had a chance. I should, yeah, should, me neither. Yeah, I'm going to try next, mine. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to do that next week and uh, before next week and, and check that out. I frankly can't believe that. Um, I, I would have trouble believing that. I wonder because there are uh, there are discs that I made, CDRs that I made in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s that also will not play. 
Right. CDRs so, are a different issue, and I have yeah. I have trouble on on my. I use the PlayStation Three to play my DVDs and CDs, and some of my D, uh, DVRs won't play all the way through on that either. Mm-hmm. But CDs and DVDs, or you know, regular press CDs and DVDs, don't have a problem. And I don't know, so I'm curious about that. I, I'm I'm going to definitely check that out and see if if yeah. that's true or not. I I kind of don't think so. But. They they do though. I mean, simply not to not to get too far off the topic, yes. but but yeah. but commercially made um, CDs at least. I haven't run into DVDs with problems, but I've run into commercially made CDs that have what they call bronzing and uh, right. they become there unplayable. Were prob- there were problems with bootlegs too. Uh, a lot of problems with com- with silver bootlegs uh, yeah. for that, you mm-hmm. know, yep. uh, and, and that, that was a huge problem in the, and there was a, there was a way to fix it. And I can't remember it would involve some using some chemical off the shelf, you know, something you could buy off the shelf. I think, I think it was actually a, I can't remember what it is now. Um, some furniture polish or some, believe it or not, or some crazy thing like that. But mm. yeah, I've I've heard of that with bootlegs, but not with commercial. Uh, I have. I've I've had plenty of commercial ones that have have um, gone bad. Uh, really? Yeah, and for different reasons. I mean, the bronzing was um, had to do particularly with um, one or two specific plants in England. Um, and there was all, there was also a problem um, with RCA domestic um, CDs that used a certain kind of printing ink. Um, these are particularly classical ones where they try to reproduce the old, you know, HMV kind of label, you know, mm-hmm. that, that, yeah. that they that they came out on in seventy eights. I recently okay. ripped my copy of uh, the McCartney years to my hard drive, so I know that mine works. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, but but that's that that absolutely is amazing though that it's been ten years yeah. since that package came out. Yeah. Anyway, I interrupted yeah. Alan, and I think Alan was going to give us his thoughts on uh, on the DVD. I think it's a you know it's a great collection. Um, some of the things we have had before on on the McCartney years, but I like also having in a concise collection like this all of the. Uh, the two versions of this one, the two versions of My Brave Face. Um, this is going to shock you, but I kind of uh, like the video of Uwe Le Soleil. Oh, my God. I think it's – I just think it's kind of funny, you know, like a little video game kind of thing. I mean, it's in a, in a way, it's – Certain aspects of it are just as bad as – I mean the, the whole video game concept is almost as mm, bad right, as the whole disco right. concept. But nevertheless, I, I don't uh, know. I, I just think it's kind of kind of humorous the way he's done it. On the uh, – you know, for me, the main thing is the Paul and Elvis and the Buds in the Studio sections. Mm-hmm, um, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I intend at some point to rip the uh, soundtracks off of those and split them up as tracks because those are yet more Elvis and Paul demos, and I just can't get mm-hmm. enough of those. The mugging, I can't – I got to say, didn't really bother me. I mean, to say that Paul was mugging is kind of like saying he plays the bass, you know? It's, he yeah. does that. I mean, it's been, him. It's what yeah, he does. Yeah. So he always I, does that. Yeah, yeah. So it, it didn't bother me really, and um, I, I might not have even thought twice about it if Steve hadn't just mentioned it. Um, it just is what it is. But uh, you know, those two things are. I, I, I just thought I, I really loved watching those, and and put it there as as you say is great to have now on DVD. It, it's sort of uh, belated. Um, so yeah, I mean. And we have complained, I think, in the past that the DVDs that came with these sets are way too short and have way too little. And I think in this case, he's given us about as much as we kind of need for for Flowers in the Dirt itself. Is there anything missing? I don't know. I, I don't think – I kind of don't think so. Hmm. Well, as far, as far as the DVD goes, no. But I it personally – there is something I think that's missing from the set, and I really wish he had thrown a sound a soundboard of a live concert on here. Uh, I think that would have been a great. Thing well, let's say do. he does trip in the live fantastic. Yeah, and, yeah, right. You know. That would probably that would, you know, that would count as the mm-hmm. the the soundboard uh, concert recording. Mm-hmm. So I remember, yeah. Wings Over America. He mm-hmm. put the Cow Palace. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, but not, that, the, so. not the whole cow, not the whole cow pill, So that was only part of it. Well, well I'm still. just saying. Well, he, he could go. Would be, yeah, go he could go the fish route and put up online yeah. <laughs> all of the concerts from the tour. Yeah. There we go. There yeah. we go. Yeah. That, how likely is that to happen? Zip. Uh, not very. <laughs> not very. That's right. And before we run out of time, Ken, let me get your thoughts. I think the DVD is just incredible, and I think it makes all the difference in the world because so many of McCartney's uh, box sets, you always feel, like Alan was saying, that he, he could have given us so much more, especially with DVD material. But here he really packed it in, and I love the 10 videos that are on there. I like the fact that there are two videos for My Brave Face and two videos for this one. I never understood that video for this one with the big eyes and the big uh, – you know, makeup around the eyes. I didn't understand. Mm-hmm. It's such a weird video. Mm-hmm. I don't understand what was going on there. They were, smoking, I, they were smoking that day. <laughs> mm-hmm. And also the fact that, um, oh, uh, by the way, Alan, yes, some of the, the videos from here are in the McCartney years. I don't recall ever even knowing that there was a video for Party Party, you know, and mm. uh, that there was a video for Distractions. Hmm. And Mm. interesting about distractions, if you listen to the music, it's a slightly different mix. You hear Mm -hmm. a little bit more bass in there. you got to listen more carefully. And I think Mm -hmm. they used part of the distractions video in Put It There. Mm -hmm. But um, the two clips, the the Paul and Elvis and Buds in the studio are wonderful. Paul and Elvis, they're doing uh, My Brave Face, Time is Coming Home, and 20 Fine Fingers and rehearsing through it. It's Mm -hmm. interesting to, to hear them go through My Brave Face in different speeds. Because there are times when they just do it really slow. Mm-hmm. And, and there's one where it's very fast. <laughs> so they're obviously experimenting with it. And I just love seeing Paul and Elvis on acoustic guitar doing 20 Fine Fingers together. Yeah, I, I love those the two clips. But I was really surprised at how much I enjoyed Put It There. Because I hadn't seen it for a long time. Mm-hmm. And the fact that a, a lot of the songs are complete performances or near complete performances. I'm pretty mm. sure Fool on the Hill, I think, was complete. And it was the arrangement that Paul used in the 8990 tour, which I always loved. Right. Plus just the with, fact, yeah. Just without the piano turning. <laughs> yeah, and without the Martin Luther King, I have a dream yes, speech in there. right. But Things We Said Today is rehearsed, and, um, and I think how many people they rehearse, even though they didn't perform it. Uh, on the tour. Um, mm-hmm. And also, there's all the 50s material from the Russian album that they did on there. And it yeah. sounded fantastic, just because that's always been one of my favorite songs on the Russian album. And here's Paul doing it with the band. I think mm-hmm. it's complete, as well as Ain't That a Shame and Lucille. So, um, yeah, I, the, I really think Paul put a lot into the, the DVD here. And it made all the difference in the world for me ranking this amongst his very best. Yeah, the only to me the only one of the in complete series of these of the archive collections that compares to this is Wings Over America, mm. as far as just the 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 volume of material that's that's included here. I mean, this is just as just absolutely jam packed, and it's so jam packed that we have devoted two hours. To uh, to going over this uh, this whole uh, this whole package, and we have just about run out of time. So, uh, first of all, Steve, why don't you give us uh, our contact information? You can contact the show by writing "Things We Said Today Radio Show" at gmail dot com. We have a Facebook group called "Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans." Uh, you can catch us on Twitter at "Things We Said Fab." And that's a. I mean, and individually, we're on Facebook. But if you want to write to us as a group, uh, that's where to go. Right. And Ken, what's going on on your website and on every little thing? Well, the website is KenMichaelsRadio.com, and uh, you can always find Beatles trivia every single week, where you can win one of nine great prizes, including Flowers in the Dirt, the special edition, and I also have it um, available on vinyl as well as some of the George Harrison remasters that have come out, like Dark Horse and um, Live in Japan. So that's on my website. Don't forget there's a lot of interviews on there with lots of people in the Beatle world. A brand new interview that I just did with someone who was just a guest on our show. 
and that's Pierce Hemmingson, the mm-hmm. author of The Beatles in Canada. It's always fun to, to listen to both interviews between this show and, and what I put on my website and on every little thing because there's some similar questions and there's some questions that weren't tackled on this show that I do in my own private interviews. So you can find that on uh, KenMichaelsRadio.com and visit there as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a matter of fact, speaking of Piers, he did a wonderful piece for a book that's going to be coming out in May from Bruce Beiser. So you already know what kind of quality this this book is going to be. Uh, the, you know, the quality it will um, have uh, going for it, and it's uh, basically it's a it's a salute to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Mm-hmm. And the core of the book actually is fan reminiscences, right? And uh, and a good portion of it are pieces. Uh, there was a I uh, actually there was a piece. I, I have two pieces in there. One is uh, a piece that I just did, and then another piece is from Beetle fan from about twenty five years ago. And also Bill King has a piece, but also Piers Hemmingson has a piece but, on. I- uh, yeah, please. Can I break some news? Please. I have I have done two interviews with Bruce on the book, and a story will be coming up in Goldmine, folks. Great. All right. Congratulations. So, thank you. And, um, and, and he also and mm-hmm. Piers also told me the full story about him and Sergeant Pepper, which is great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I also know Bruce gave me some information, and I'm not going to break it yet. I'll wait until. No. I'll wait until uh, the story comes out. But he told me some of the celebrities that are involved with the Pepper Yes. Book. And mm-hmm. I yeah. don't know if you know who they are, Al, but... Yeah, because I, I, uh, I proof the, the whole book. Oh, you proof the whole book? Okay. One yeah. of wow. them in, two of them in particular are very cool. Mm-hmm. I'm yep. not going to break the information no. now, but two of them are extremely cool. And Bruce will be with us here uh, in early, uh, early May. Yep. Shortly before the the yep. book is actually published. Yep. So there you go. So there you go. So this has been a full uh, <laughs> a full session, uh, two hours of uh, of a look at the uh, the flowers in the dirt deluxe uh, archive collection, mm-hmm. and uh, it's uh, and the time has just absolutely flown by. So, for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, this is uh, Al Sussman, and thanks for listening to Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.